just a quick video to take a look inside my scope. I had three, the um, soft keys were getting quite um, intermittent recently, so I had a quick look on the Agilent website, and the replacement key rubber is only about uh, about three and a half quid. And it's quite surprising there's no shipping or handling cost on it either, which I thought was quite good. So I decided to um, replace it because these little carbon um, pads go. They say, yeah, you probably find this in remote controls. They certain keys get get quite intermittent. You have to wiggle them around to use them. Um, I was going to look at maybe replacing the knobs. The knobs are these sort of soft soft rubber things and they get a bit sort of manky over time they get a bit worn because of the softness but these are actually quite expensive and the big ones are nine quid each so i think i'm gonna have a go at just giving these a bit of a clean maybe give them an overnight soak in some soapy water or something to um get all the uh, finger grease and gunge off of them to clean them up a bit and here are the knobs after cleaning all i've done is put them in some warm water with some washing li one washing powder the same sort of stuff you use to wash your clothes left them for a few hours taken them out um dried them off and they come out quite clean it's quite a handy technique for pretty much any plastic although most plastics you can clean with solvent or various other things it, it can be quite labor intensive especially for stuff that's got a lot of lots of int intricate nooks and crannies and so on whereas um the, the other problem with solvents is some solvents can attack plastic so um the washing powder the nice thing is that you know it, it's pretty safe so um, but the big thing is it, it, it requires a lot less labour in that if you leave it soaking for a while that most of the dirt will just lift itself off and it doesn't need much more than a rinse to clean it off afterwards so if you've got something like an old scope or a bit of test gear um, quite a quick way of just getting it looking really nice is just strip off every bit of plastic you can and just dunk it in warm water with washing powder for a few hours and then give it a rinse off afterwards and leave it to dry and um, save you a lot of effort Right, this is the um, front of the front panel PCB. It's actually made in two pieces. There's this little end bit, which which is the um, the soft keys under the display. But this is actually manufactured on the same panel. You can see it's got these um, breakout points here. So this is made as one um, PCB. Then this snapped off. And um, there's a little bit of flex cable. It's actually a through hole sort of uh, flex to connect it. Um, and all you've got you've got this. Uh, shielding over most of the most of the front panel um Ferrara shielding you've got a few little clusters of leads here and there and the pads for the rubber for the rubber membrane um keypad um, down here you've got the connections. These are connections for various types of active probe. Um, interesting, they seem to have actually got some sort of countersinking on the PCB, which I've never seen before, but I assume there's, they're just drilled with a countersink um, or a ball type tool before plating to get that effect so that the, um, the contacts that are attached to the probe when it sort of connects onto the BNC connector just sort of make contact in there. So that's going to provide power and also um, potentially things like calibration data back for things like current probes and differential probes and other sorts of, sorts of specialist probes. And there's the back of the front panel board, um, there's a connector that connects a ribbon cable down to the main board, um, there's, a few, there's a whole load of shift registers here for um, presumably controlling the LEDs, uh, all these controls are rotary encoders, um, there's a few various other laser deconverter there, I think that's possibly for reading the, um, the uh, some of the probe variations are just, are just specified by a resistor on here, like for example if it's a times 10 or a times 100 probe, um, that's just a fixed value resistor, so there's an HD there. There's also that, the yeah, HD also has a built-in temperature sensor, so I don't know whether they actually use that or not. Um, the other little detail on these shift registers, they look, seem to have dual footprinted them all to take either package, um, so if they get a part shortage, um, they've got the choice of two different package types, each one of these seems to have a, an SO package next to it. Um, and there's a nice Gwed C I.O. expander there, no microcontroller on here, so nothing particularly exciting. Um, big resistors here, I'm guessing that may be perhaps a power supply circuit for the LEDs or something. Um, there's a sort of transistor with a fairly big bit of um, track to access a heatsink and a couple of big chunky resistors there. Um, there's also here, there's some exposed copper uh, exposed pads with ridges of solder and these make contact with the um, these spring clips to give a nice low impedance coupling to the front panel so the, the shielding is uh, is effective. Quite a neat little detail the way they've actually done this to avoid the need for any screws they've got these hooks on here so that the board just goes down slides across and then the end of the board just snaps down like this to, to locate it so there's this 
the, the, the stop just prevents it moving backwards so nice sort of fixing without any screws and the main board's actually just held in by some fairly conventional plastic latch latch type fixings see they um they didn't use these on this board just because the board's just too small really um the other thing you notice is they all this copper um all, a lot of the unused area of the board have got this this copper pad, pad just basically isolated copper pads on it um there's a couple of reasons for this one is um it's called copper balancing which means that you ideally want to have a similar amount of copper on each side of the pcb so that when it gets reflow soldered uh, it reduces warping but also in terms of pcb cost it costs money to actually copper off the pcb so if you've got a large area that's unused it's actually better to leave the copper on there um because it just you know shaves the odd cent off your pcb cost in high volume because they don't need to etch so much off of it and this is the top side not really a great deal to see here we've got the fans actually made, fan made by panasonic um power supply fairly standard switch mode power supply looks like it's a an adaption of a, a standard off the shelf unit the only slightly unusual thing is this mains input pcb is that um, one thing scopes need which most other products don't is a frequency reference from the mains so what they've got here there's just a little circuit down here there's um an opto isolate for a power resistor and a couple of um capacitors so that's just producing a um, well, 50 or 60 hertz depending on what country you're in reference for the uh, the line mode trigger um, you've got the power switch this is operated by you know, a mechanical button from the uh, the front panel minor little detail as well they've mounted it again they sort of this whole design has got very few screws in it um, they've got one fixing screw here and then the other two fixing points so just got like these keyhole studs on it so the board just slides in and then screws down with one screw so just to minimise the manufacturing cost. And we've got a display here, this is a conventional TFT display with a CCFL backlight. Um, some people sort of complain, oh CCFL doesn't last very long, but I mean, this scope here is probably about nine years old and it's been used pretty much daily and the backlight's still fine. Um, there's a the backlight inverter here. Right here on the underside we've got the main board, uh, which takes up most of the bottom of the case. Quite a, a lot of stuff, a lot of interesting stuff on here, so let's take a look in uh, some detail. So you start up this corner, we've got um, lots of power supply circuitry, we've got these inductors, voltage regulators all over the place, obviously those are close to where the, um, the power comes in. Got battery for the battery backed up memory which holds sort of configuration data and <coughs> store traces, all that sort of stuff. There's a, this is a high speed connector, I think this is probably for debug because there's, there's nothing that obviously plugs into, into it. Um, here's a big custom chip, I think the processor's in there, I believe this is based on a power PC processor. I can't remember where I figured that out, but a long time ago I think I read somewhere that it's based on a power PC architecture. <coughs> Next to that we've got um, an FPGA, this is a 3S1000 uh, Xilinx Spartan FPGA, so it's a fairly meaty sized FPGA. Um, flash memory for the program storage, um, SD RAM down there. Down here we have a, uh, a Cypress USB chip. This handles, I think, the USB device side. I think there's also a USB host chip in there somewhere for the um, USB <coughs> stick interface. One thing I noticed there's actually a beeper in here, but I've never actually heard this thing go beep. I'm not sure what they use that for. Uh, maybe that's just an option they put on there and decided they didn't want to use it. But um, in sort of, I don't know, about eight or nine years of using, using this scope, I've never heard it go beep. More power supply stuff around here. Massive great ceramic uh, capacitors. So a bit more power supply. That's just a, this is just a heat sink over a regulator chip. And we move over here. This is the uh, the front end where all the, the meaty acquisition stuff happens. I'm guessing these two chips here are the A to D's, and from here we can actually see these differential lines with all these wiggly wiggly tracks. Um, the reason for those is to minimise skew, so that all the traces have the same length going from this chip to the next chip. You see this commonly on things like DDR, RAM modules, and so on. Um, so it's just to make sure that all signals arrive at exactly the same time. They just see so the um, you've got the long tracks that are fairly straight and then the shorter ones are, are, have got more and more wiggles in them to keep the overall length the same. Here's the front end, there's four front end modules, I've just pulled the shield off of one of them and we've got this again, this custom front end chip here. Um, <coughs> I'm guessing that's pure analogue and then you've got these 
Um, you see these quite wide tracks, these will be a carefully matched impedance lines going into the HD converter. And we've got two channels going into each HD converter, so the HDs are multiplexed. And in fact, if you look at the sampling rate, um, if you want to get the maximum sampling rate off two channels, you actually use like channels one and three, so you're actually running the two HDs in parallel. If you run one and two, your sample rate at the top end um, reduces, so that they're clearly using um, one HD per two channels. The other reason for that is that for cost reduction on the different models, so on a two channel model, they obviously only fit a single HD. Um, these will be the processors that handle all the uh, data acquisition. Um, there's almost certainly one, of the, at least one of these is the memory. Um, I'm guessing this one in the middle may be to do with timing because we've got an oscillator, what looks like an oscillator module, uh, although the package is a little bit weird. I wonder if that's maybe something a little bit more exotic. Going into this middle chip and then I'm guessing sort of acquisition of memory for each side on these two chips under the big heat sinks. Down here these are just things like inputs for um, trig out and uh, timing reference in. Uh, there's a relay that's obviously for selecting functions, an unpopulated relay package here. These are just HCMOS devices. Um, down here these are the inputs for the mixed signal section. These actually use two custom um, Agilent chips. Um, eight channels each. There's some resistor networks just for the input matching and probably some protection components. Anyway, I, um, I won't bother taking this board out, but I have previously taken it out and I've got some stills, so I'll have a look at that on the uh, just the still photos. Right, here's a still of the underside of the main PCB that I took quite a while ago when I first got the scope and took it fully to bits. Um, the left hand side, you can top left, you can see the analog stage is not a great deal under there. Um, Further down you can see the bottom of those A to D chips and again more traces, parallel track traces there. Um, judging by the number of traces I'm guessing it's probably just a parallel, just a parallel data bus going from uh, the A to D's up to the uh, acquisition chips. Further down some more what looks like timing components in the middle. The red switch in the bottom left hand corner, that's so you can lock the calibration so you can prevent the uh, calibration being changed from the front panel. And over on this top right hand side you can see tons of uh, tantalum capacitors for the power supply circuitry. Uh, down here there's the um, main processor and the FPGA, some more DRAM at the bottom, some SRAM towards the left and also some more DRAM above it. That's probably being used for the acquisition memory by the FPGA. Uh, at the bottom there's a little Philips USB host chip that's providing the interface for the front panel memory stick connector. And in the middle there's a uh, Natsumi DS90C383. This is the driver for the LCD. This takes um, parallel RGB signal in and then turns that into high-speed LVDS signals so you, you just don't need so many um, cores going down the cable. This is very commonly used in laptops and so on so that there's a relatively small number of connections to the LCD and so it's a very similar interface to um, uh, DVI. Neat little production detail here. Um, these encoders are a mixture of um, clicky ones and sort of free rotating ones and they've used different shaft colours for the two types so that when and these are almost certainly manually assembled onto the PCBs so you can immediately see which type of encoder it is just by what colour the shaft is and obviously it makes inspection easier as well. 